Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What up, everybody? You're listening to the Command Zone. Uh, I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Woohoo! We're back. I'm back. We're back. We're Jimmy's back. back. From Europe. Turns out jet lag is a lot easier the other way around, coming back to the United States. Yeah, you actually don't seem too uh, much the worse for wear. No. Well, I you could be just faking it. I don't know. I, hmm? What, what are we talking about? What time is it in London right now? Uh, it is nine hours past this, so it is uh, like 5 a.m. Well, you like mm, to stay up late Top anyway. of the morning. Top to of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm back. Uh, it was really hard at Aquaman going the other way, but now that I'm back here, I... Like stayed up until eleven when I came back the night of, and then I just immediately passed out and woke up at eight the next day and was like, "I'm good." <laughs> That's it's good to be young, man, because I, I jet lag kills me these days. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go to Asia in, in the winter, and I think coming back I'm gonna be wrecked both well, ways. Well, that's like too. a sixteen hour difference too. It's twice <sighs> as hard. I know. Good times. Good times. You know, I'm always up for a challenge. Uh, um, hey, but while you were gone, something happened. Something exciting. It was accidental. Yeah. So the story I heard, I don't know if this is 100% true, but it makes a good story, if, even if it's not, is that one of the big box retailers, somebody was like looking at their site and they had accidentally put up an image. And the image was the product, uh, I don't know, what, what do they call that? The, um, the pre-con? Yeah, it was the Commander it's, Precon yeah, deck. Yes, the uh, the product shot of it that they list on the website saying you can buy this, and in this case, it was the it was the packaging. The packaging, yeah, the red white Boros deck for Commander 2015. <gasps> it's called Wade into Battle. We're pretty sure this is real. I, we should say. Hold on, Wade into Battle. Do you, red white doesn't Wade. That's not they're not blue. Well, uh, that's <laughs> just, just this guy's nickname is Wade. Oh, okay. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Wade, <laughs> into <laughs> battle. <laughs> He's being ordered. Yeah. Um, we should say, disclaimer, we're not, it's not 100% sure, certain that this mm-hmm. is not fake, but we're fairly certain. Mythic Spoiler is running with it. Most people think that if this is a Photoshop do- job, it's uh, amazingly well done. It is amazingly well done if so it's a Photoshop it's job. So it's possible that it is fake, but we're pretty sure it's real. So um, the only thing you can see from the packaging is one card. It is one of the new commanders. Yeah, and just so you guys know, Wizards releases a commander deck every year, uh, five of them. They're pre-cons, they're pre-constructed, they have stuff like Soul Ring in there, and cool utility lands. And last year they did monocolored, the year before that they did... Um, three-colored. Three-colored, yeah, I forget the exact pairings. And the year before that was three-colored, and now we're going to enemy-colored pairings. So Red, White, Boros is of that enemy color pairing and yeah, there's five there's gonna be every year there's five decks yeah. and so there's five enemy pairs so there's or five gonna... different whatever so yeah this year we have all the enemy pairs and we have one huge spoiler uh now do you guys remember when we talked about earlier on the show that the, uh, wizards released some information about commander 2015 and it was like it's going to change the way that you like your your experience not experience i don't think it was the word they used but your sort of your progress they said in the something game. about leveling up leveling or up. experience gaining experience maybe yeah. yeah i don't i don't remember the exact wording but it was implied that there would be some sort of level up or experience counter mechanic yeah or something that affected the way that you played based on how long you essentially played or stuff that you'd done and it's all come to fruition it's all here it's all here um so i'll let you read the card jimmy because sure. i don't want to have to pronounce it uh it is wade uh <laughs> comma into battle now uh we have one oversized foil commander card that isn't spoiled it's calumny disciple of Irawas. uh two red white for a three three legendary creature giant soldier hmm interesting so okay four mana three three me yeah but he is boros and it's a legendary creature so this person could be your commander uh he has double st- wait is it a she um, it's a she oh is it a she yeah she has double strike and Vigilance, which oh, yeah, is already she. very good from the get-go. So a four-mana, three-three, double-strike Vigilance. Yeah, getting better. Uh, and here is where all that stuff comes to fruition, the idea of leveling up in the game. Whenever you cast a creature spell with converted mana cost five or greater, you get an experience counter. And Kalemni, Disciple of Erewas, gets plus one, plus one for each experience counter you have. So something important to note is that the experience counters actually go on the player yeah interesting. it doesn't go on the card which makes sense because if your commander then went to the command zone it would lose any experience counters it has on it so that wouldn't really be great yeah the fact that the player keeps the counters 
And as far as we know, I mean, we haven't seen all the rest of the cards, obviously, in the pre-cons. And mm-hmm. um, there will be 55 new cards. But as far as we know right now, you can't remove those counters in any way. Yeah. So once a player gets an experience counter, it seems like it'll It's kind of like infect, uh, stuff that's going to get affected by things like proliferate. Um, interestingly enough, people have drawn comparisons to Skullbriar, the Walking Grave, which is a, a commander card that got a lot better once you couldn't tuck a commander anymore. Uh, and it, it's a creature that has counters on it, but the counters remain on Skullbriar whenever it goes to any other zone. So, but like, it doesn't zone. if you tuck it. Right. Uh, however, that's on the creature. And, and Calumny is something that says experience counters go on you, the player, and then it gets plus one, plus one for each experience counter you have. So if you play this turn four, turn five, uh, you'll probably be getting making her into a 4-4 double strike vigilant that's going to swing at someone and probably kill them in the Boros way through combat. Yeah, and again, the way that you as the player get an experience counter while Kalemnia is out is you cast a creature spell with converted mana cost 5 or greater. Now, this so, opens up a huge door, though. I mean, what's going to happen? Experience counters. Well, I mean, I'm assuming that this will be a theme throughout the pre-cons now. Yeah, every single Again, th- we're just making assumptions. We don't know. <laughs> But it, it feels like at least one of the commanders from each of the precons will have some sort of experience counter theme to them. Yeah. We don't know, but it feels like that could that could be a thing. It would make the most sense, I think. Um, the other thing I'm curious about is can you get experience counters from other cards in the 55 new cards? Yeah, really good point. Because if there are ways to cheat getting a ton of experience counters, then you, know, you could get this person out with you know already as, like a, as a 5-5 or whatever. Can you remove them somehow from other players? Yeah. Uh, can you affect... You know, can you somehow double your experience counters with an instant or something? Uh, we don't know, really. <laughs> that already sounds like it would be insane. <laughs> it does, but it also gets into this thing where the experience counter cards won't really mix that well with cards that don't necessarily. Yeah. So that can be kind of uh, playing with fire, if you will, if the set is really incestuous and that it only works with itself. Uh, that has been problems with certain... Um, you know, blocks before where like things like mm-hmm. splice onto arcane. If you, they don't ever do that again, then those cards just are all kind of worthless outside of those sets. Yeah. So I don't know. That's that's one thing to talk about. You did mention pro- proliferate, which I think is interesting. Uh, yeah. People are already speculating about how you affect these counters, and they're and proliferate's the best way. Yeah, it's the only way they think you can end the game yeah. right now, right? Yeah. And contagion engine is the colorless mm-hmm. way to do it. So contagion engine. As a result, has I think it's jumped up a little bit in price, uh, especially the foil. I think it's still the foil is hugely. Pr- I was talking yeah. to Jason Ald about this, and he says, "Yeah, I I, I kind of spec'd on that, and now it's like an eighty dollar foil or something crazy." That's yeah, pretty smart. Uh, but proliferate says you choose any number of permanents and or players with counters on them, and then give each another counter of a kind already there. Uh, Modern Masters twenty fifteen had a proliferate sub theme uh, in the green blue. It is a green blue mechanic. Mm-hmm. So I would assume that the green and the blue precons or the the precon decks that have green and blue in them, it's going to be interesting to see how they balance it because they can affect their experience counters, whereas the other colors, like red-white, as far as we know, has no way except for Contagion Engine to affect their counters. Yeah. Or casting big, big, big old spells with Kalemnia on the battlefield. So we should say, um, because it's been thrown out there, people are speculating that like doubling season mm-hmm. would affect the experience counters. It does not. Nope. It says permanence you control all players, not a permanent. Um, I mean, I'm permanent. Yeah. It's also things that affect plus one, plus one counters like hardened scales would not interact with experience counters. Right. Um, really proliferates kind of the only way we know of right now. There, is there a fringe case or anything? We're not sure. If you hear of one or you think there is one, there's got to be some. Definitely tweet yeah. at us and let us know. Um, but it is very interesting, and I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see, like how much this mechanic is you know how present it is throughout mm-hmm. this set yeah if it's just something that's only on these sort of legendary creature cards that are supposed to be your commander then that'd be interesting if it if it if they do want to push it you, we might see a reprint of something like contagion engine in in these sets um, i could see that uh i mean i could also see this like this is good for infect originally that's why proliferate was kind of this cool crazy thing because you got some of that five infect counters you could start adding them up and up and up and up up and you know contagion engine proliferates twice so you could really quickly get someone to you know die i mean there's gonna be uh, two decks with green in them. Mm-hmm. There'll be green, black, and green, blue. And so, man, it feels like Infect with either of those will be very strong because you're already going to want to be pro- proliferating yeah. your experience counters. And now you just get double 
usage out of your proliferate because you can proliferate the infect damage, the poison counters that you put Ooh, on people. That'd so be, it Craig feels be like they, to hear that. they will have, have to have thought of that because it automatically feels like it will make those two color pairings better. Yeah. Now, here's the thing that I want to talk about. Um, so in these commander sets, they usually give you three legendary creature choices to choose from. Mm-hmm. Um, and last year, it would be like you 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 could do like Titania and Kembaka Regent were the other two outside and, of... And uh, uh, Fraley's. Outside of Fraley's, yeah. So usually you have three options to be the commander in the set. And I'm, I'm always excited to see what they do for Boros. And I've been, I talked about this on the show because Boros doesn't have that many options. I don't know if this is the most exciting Boros entry we've ever had. Yeah, I'm totally with you. We've talked about this so many times. And I know there are people out there that love Boros. And we always get yelled at when we sort of bag on Boros. And the pro- bagging on Boros. Bagging on Boros. The problem with Boros is that it's very hard to build a Boros deck that's interesting. Yeah. It's not that you can't build one that's powerful. It's just that all the Boros commanders seem to do the same thing. And this They're is all combat related usually. And making a creature big and hitting you hard yeah. for damage. They're all sort of aggro based. And this one seems worse than a lot of them because I'm in a color pairing that doesn't do mana ramp very well. Yep. And now this guy just or this girl just wants me to cast really big creatures. That's not usually what Boros wants to do, and they're not particularly good at it because yeah. they don't have a good way to cheat stuff, you know, big stuff out. Like cheat um by Reduce cheat I don't mean cost. like Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like an Animar kind of effect. I mean, I guess they'll just play some soul rings, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's all gonna be um mana rocks. Yeah. But again, with mana rocks, you need card draw because what happens is you end up with these hands that are like all lands and mana rocks. Yeah. And so card draw will even you that will even that out, but these two colors are bad at that. It's just this doesn't solve, like you said, the problem that we have with Boros in general. Like if they took and they took the mechanic that they've really cultivated lately, which is, you know, the outpost siege mechanic, the Chandra mm-hmm. Pyromaster mechanic, which is exile a card until end of turn you may play that card. I think so it's cost, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically card draw. If they could slap that onto a commander, I'm in. Yeah, and it's going to be up to, I guess, what the other cards in the set are going to be. And these spoilers do start soon, so we will know for sure if Kalemni is real or not. Uh, although, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm pretty in on the fact that this card is real. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm pretty sure it is. And spoiler alert. Spoiler we're getting alert. A, we're getting a spoiler. We'll talk about it more at the end of the show. But, I mean, we're not going to spoil it at the end of the show. Yeah. But we're going to talk about spoiling it. Yeah, you know, and it's... it. it I'm going to go on a little soapbox here and say that I'm actually kind of sad that this was spoiled. Because spoilers are usually pretty carefully organized in a way to build hype around the set or to introduce things in a specific order. And having this just out there, I think, might throw some stuff off balance. Because, like, for one, we don't know that much about experience counters, right? Yeah. And on just by looking at Calumny, everyone's been kind of like, meh, well, nothing too impressive to add to the Boros sort of, like, catalog. So... I, f- I feel like other cards that we're going to see spoiled coming up quickly first, maybe even line to be spoiled, will address stuff like experience counters and the new p- parts of Commander that may have made this spoiler more satisfying knowing other stuff prior to it. Yeah, you'll notice that when they spoil sets, they have a way that they do it, and usually they spoil big, exciting cards early on to yeah. just drum up excitement and get momentum going. The issue I would have here is that this is the b- the large foil card on the front of a packaging so it was probably going to be one of the early cards spoiled no matter what. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's not exciting, I agree, but it's not like this was a card they could hide for very long. So Yeah, exactly. But it could have been accentuated by something else that they threw out there. Maybe. I mean, either way, I'm excited to learn about experience counters. Uh, I'm interested. I'm always interested to see how Wizards is going to push the boundaries in terms of changing the quote-unquote rules of the game that we play. So the other exciting part about Commander product is that not only do you get three commanders per precon, and we should say that usually not all of those commanders are brand new cards. So, yeah. so there's a good chance there'll be like two new commanders and one that's a reprint. Mm-hmm. But you also get new cards, brand new cards. We know that there's going to be 55 new cards total across the five precons. That doesn't mean that's each. Sweet. Yeah, that doesn't mean each will have 11. There could be the same new card in multiple of the decks is possible. Yep. You know, they could be weighted. This like happened last year with Arcane Lighthouse, I believe. Mm-hmm. The, it could be weighted so there's 12 in one, 10 in one, 9 in one, 12, you know. Th- th- it's not evenly distributed. But these new cards have a tendency to be very good. Yeah. Uh, some new cards that came out uh, originally in Commander product were things like Chaos Warp. Ooh, so good. Toxic Deluge. True Name Nemesis. Which became legacy playable mm-hmm. and made the deck cost a lot more than, than MSRP at a lot of LGSs. 
And as a side note, they are now using the Commander product as to sort of seed things, new things that they want to go in legacy only. Yeah, so it's actually really cool. I, I think that's really sweet. Yeah, super interesting. And it's a way for them to insert new cards into the legacy format, but without having to go through the normal process mm-hmm. of also being available in standard and modern. Because a lot of the time, a card that's playable in legacy is way too powerful to be played in standard or modern. It will just warp those formats too much. Unless it's called Treasure Cruise. <laughs> and that is too powerful for every format, including Legacy. Yeah. Um, the Lieutenant cycle last year was a cool cycle yep. of cards that cared if your commander was in play. And Planeswalkers the- that could be commanders was the big one from last year as yep. well. Yeah. So it's going to be really sweet. I'm, I'm always looking forward to this part as well of the commander sets. Um, yeah, because we just get brand new toys to play with that have never been there before. Yeah, and Chaos Warp is something that every single mono red deck has to run because it's one of those catch-all things that red just doesn't have an answer to sometimes. For like, sure. Red can't deal with certain things, and Chaos Warp is one of the ways it does it. So the thing is, if you're good at math, you're counting and you're going, well, a commander deck has 100 cards. There's going to be five of them. That's 500 cards. Okay, some of that's going to be land. Mm-hmm. We know there's 55 new cards. So what the heck are all the other cards... In the pre-con decks. Wait, I'm not good at math, but I could still figure that out. There's a lot. (laughs) And they're all going to be reprints. Yeah. So this is also another exciting part because they can reprint, besides what's on the reserve list, they can reprint whatever they want. Yep. And again, it runs into the same thing. They don't have to throw it into standard if they want to reprint it. So it's similar to Modern Masters in a way. They, They get to put some higher value stuff out there and start sort of hedging against a price rise that may be not unfair, but unbalanced correct now a lot of people out there are going yeah they're grumbling grumbling right now especially i'm sure the professor if he's listening is <laughs> grumbling grumbling because while what we said is true they have shown wizards i mean has shown a real hesitance to print really high value stuff like there's tons yeah. of stuff they could be printing they could we'll talk about some of these things uh that aren't on the reserve list and they haven't really in the past done a lot of like super high value stuff now they've done some yeah. things that i'd put at like mid-level value Correct. And some things, and it's been great because Avenger of Zendikar, I think, is one of those cards mm-hmm. that didn't see that many. I mean, like, Worm Coil print, Engine. Worm Coil, yeah. Um, Even just Soul Ring itself. Yeah. Was very, you know, what would be pretty expensive, but they've printed it so many times now. Yeah. And it's nice because it does take those cards from being like 10 and up to 5 and below. Right. You know, and it doesn't. No one complains. It's not like people were hoarding these specific cards and being like, oh, no, my collection is toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the thing we don't talk about, about why they don't do really big flashy reprints of $125 cards is because that actually has a lot of negativity to it in that when you do something like that, the people that already have the $150 cards, then mm-hmm. suddenly those prices plummeted to 20 bucks. It Listen, I know a lot of people are out there. I don't care about that person. But what happens is, it tells everybody not to invest in expensive magic cards because the danger the danger is too high so they have to show a certain amount of respect for the secondary market they can't actually talk about it but if they just yeah sort of don't reprint super expensive cards then it makes people more willing to buy in and if you have a game where people aren't willing to buy in because they're afraid that if i spend $100 on a card or $80 on a card then tomorrow you'll reprint it and it'll be worth $2 then all of a sudden you have people that are just waiting to play your game or not playing it, and that's yeah, bad. Yeah. There's, it's a really complicated ecosystem. Uh, you know, If Prof was here, we would have a big argument about it. <laughs> I, I, Debate. Not, a civil discussion. A civil discussion. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that we agree with it or just disagree with it. There are reasons why they do stuff. Um, we're going to do... I, we didn't even tease the main topic, did we? We don't have a main topic. Yes, we do. Just Our kidding. main topic today... Top is... five most wanted reprints in Commander 2015. That's why we're talking about reprints now. Yep. So See, that's the main top. Wow. We're out of practice. We're gone one week and we're just out of practice. Yeah. What's going to happen? We're going to have a crazy Thursday episode too. Oh God, the show's devolving. What? <laughs> I'm flowing. We're burning <laughs> out. No, we're not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe um, a little. The other thing is that Wizards does set their own precedent when it comes to this sort of stuff. So they've shown what kind of cards they want to reprint and they're not throwing in like $100 cards, just reprinting them just willy nilly because like Josh said, it would make people lose faith in the company itself. So they know they have to sort of hedge a little bit here and, and choose choose their battles wisely. Otherwise, they'll have a, a player base that is going to become disenfranchised and, and losing faith. Yeah, I mean, want. I guess. I, I can see the argument on the other side, which is that you have a whole bunch of players right now that want to play, want to play certain want, cards. Yeah. And so it's just there's a philosophical debate going on there about, you know, it's basically sort of the difference between like, 
I don't know, uh, a really expensive restaurant and McDonald's, you know, yeah. both business models have been proven to work. And so it's just the problem is that Wizards is in one and it's hard to switch over to the other without losing all the current customers. I don't know. I don't want to get into all that. What we're going to do here is we're each going to, we each made a list mm -hmm. of what our top five most wanted reprints are for Commander 2015. And screw Wizards and their whole policy. We're just going to say the cards we think we would love it if they reprinted. We're not saying it's realistic. Well, mine's more realistic. Jimmy's when I looked at your list, I was like, oh, Josh went all out. There's, there's... <laughs> we made sure to have no overlap on these lists because we normally we do top tens and we have a few cards that are overlapping. In this case, we do have very different lists, but I agree with all the... I would love to see all of these cards reprinted. I mean, there's two on my list that are possible. I think there's really one that's that's actually possible. Yeah. Um, there's definitely three that are impossible. That It will not happen, but I do want to talk about them. Um I it's guess your before, wish list. Before we go through We're it. Coming up on Christmas, Josh, you're allowed to have a wish list. <laughs> I mean, come on. It would be so awesome. Yeah. Uh, before we go through the list, we're just going to talk really quickly about some of the criteria we use to come up with the list. Mm -hmm. um, just availability of the card. So cards that are hard to get a hold of right now uh, that people would want in Commander would go up on the list. Um, this is tied to the next one, which is expense. So usually if a card's hard to get a hold of, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So... You know, you don't call for a reprint on a card that is not expensive. If it's 50 cents or a dollar or three bucks, then that's fine because most people are willing to pay that. Yeah, totally. And then usefulness in a variety of decks. So we know that Wizards is only going to reprint a certain amount of cards, especially high value cards. So it would be nice if they reprinted cards that could go in a lot of decks instead of like super specific ones. Yep. So uh, we have some really spicy things here. Do you want to just go onto the lists? Let's go onto the list. You you want to do your number five first? Sure. Yeah. So my number five are the Eventide cycle of Filterlands, and uh, I say Eventide because Filterlands exist for both enemy and allied color pairings, and the even uh, from Eventide that set uh, those those lands are the, the enemy, enemy color ones. Yeah. yeah. So sense. what the uh, what the Filterlands are are they're lands that can come that come into play untapped, and you can tap it for one colorless mana. And then let's take Fetid Heath, for example. It is the black-white enemy color-paired uh, filter land. You can tap either black or white and tap the land, and you can add white-white or white-black or black-black to your mana pool. So it turns one color of mana into any combination of the two colors of mana that you want. So in this case, uh, I want these cards reprinted because they're great lands for Commander. Mm -hmm. um, they're fantastic when you only have one color and you need to cast something like Kiki Jiki that takes red, red, red. You know, just having a filter land helps you filter your mana into becoming the right colors for those harder to cast cards. Like black has a lot of those cards, for example. Um, and right now they're all sort of fifteen dollars and up. And uh, for what they do, it makes sense. These haven't been printed in a long time. Uh, they're from an older set, but I would love to see these filter lands come in, especially because we're doing enemy color pairs in Commander Twenty Fifteen. Yeah, it totally makes sense. They're great lands. They come in untapped. They do tap for a colorless, so they're not totally worthless. Yeah, uh, that, and that's super valuable, the fact that they can give you mana even if it's not, you don't have the other color to filter or whatever. It's still great. Like, great, I can at least use this land instead of having it sit here being useless. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I've often wanted to put these in a deck, but I'm just not probably going to spend $15 on that land when literally like a Guild Gate or something is close. A Scry land from Theros yeah, is great. Yeah, exactly. You know? So... Um, yeah, I'm with you. This would be awesome if they reprinted these lands. And actually, this is possible. Yeah, I think it's pretty possible. I mean, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd put this, the possibility at like a 7.5. Instead of the storm scale, it's the possibility scale. <laughs> possibility storm seven scale. 7.5? Man, that's that's generous. I, we I mean, as far as possible now, will right. they... I mean, is there a lot of call out there for these in other formats? I, no, no other formats as far as I can tell. So I don't think you're going to really kill people in the in the pocketbook by reprinting it here yeah certainly not they haven't been hoarding them i mean i hope not because if it's not playable in legacy and modern then why are you hoarding these cards um yeah that's a great call uh, it would be awesome give me they my filter lands. Some lands yeah that's the thing is we haven't usually seen that many lands in the commander products they, they'll put in uh like arcane lighthouse which is a utility land and well, when command they did the, tower but when they did the triple colors they would do the uh, tri lands that right that, that fit like crumbling necropolis and stuff yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> Sorry. Those were uncommons, however. These these Eventide lands and the Shadowmore lands are unfortunately. Yeah, they are. Uh, well, 
Mine are also lands. My number five. Oh, really? What kind of lands are yours? <laughs> Mine are the enemy fetch lands. Enemy fetch lands. So we've heard a lot about these recently. <laughs> We're talking about the scalding tarns and the misty rainforest of the world. Yep, the, the 50 to $80. I've seen more in expedition form than I have in real life. Like In I, normal, in normal Zendikar Zendikar form? Zend- yeah, Zendikar form. <laughs> yeah. This is something a lot of people are calling for now on the possibility scale. If you don't know what these are, these are basically the inverse of what the cons fetch lands are. So yep. the cons fetch lands are the allied color pairing, and the Zendikar fetch lands are the enemy color pairing, which were in the enemy color pairing uh, commander precon decks, so that mm-hmm. would make sense. Um, they haven't been reprinted since original Zendikar. They all spiked as soon as the Battle for Zendikar uh full spoiler was announced and we saw that there were not going to be the other fetch lands in there people freaked out and they're definitely played in modern and legacy so there's a yep. lot of demand for them and the price has gone up 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 yep and people are very upset because it's hard to get into modern uh to afford to afford these things is like if you've got to pay 500 dollars just for your mana base then it's just hard to play a format so yeah. people are crying out for this reprint uh this would be a good place to do it i don't think they actually will i mean on the possibility sca- storm scale mm-hmm. I give this a two. I'll give you a zero point five. <laughs> Come on, it's got to be better than a. a Come on, man. Not, I mean, a five nah. percent chance. Okay, fine. I'll give you a one. There okay, it's... here's the thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this these fetch lands are not going to be reprinted this year or in the in the, in the winter set. They're going to be reprinted in the next fall set. Yeah, when prediction. Khan's block falls off. Yep. I'm with you there, and I also think that. That well, would be the best place, I think, from my view, viewing it and from Wizard's standpoint, I think that would be the best place to do it. I also think from a long-term perspective, it will be better for players if it's printed then rather than in the Commander products. Because the mm-hmm. Commander product is limited print run. Um, it will make such a run on that product that the people that actually want it yeah. will have trouble getting it. It'll be like fat packs for Battle for Zendikar. You'll see stores cracking open just the Commander Precons and only just taking to sell those out. It. Just to, yeah. So it, it'll be bad, and it won't actually lower the price by as much as it could because this product is limited, so there will only be a certain amount. Yeah, not to mention it's not like you can buy a booster and grab one. You have to buy a, you know, this product costs over $30 to yeah. get. So Well, if you're Wizards, you also, like, a lot of people were like, well, why don't you just print it in both? Mm-hmm. But then what would happen is the excitement would be dulled for that set that it comes out in yeah. because you put it in the commander product. So you're actually, I don't know. I just don't see them doing it. You're right. It's 0. 0.5. It's not 2. <laughs> it's 0. 0.5? Dang. Yeah, you're right. That stuff down the I want it, but it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, we all want it. Um, the other thing is that if Wizards does want to reprint these, they're, they're not, them putting in the commander product when this, when this kind of card is for legacy and modern, modern. players and the commander's a casual format just is like, oh... I don't know, guys. Well, I mean, it would work. It would, it would sell totally the Commander product like like crazy. Hotcakes, baby. Yeah, but I just think long-term, it wouldn't even be great for players unless they also printed it in whatever's after Oath of the Gatewatch. Yeah. In which case, it would hurt the sales of that set because it would dull the excitement for that set because it would have just been reprinted, even if it wasn't reprinted enough, yeah, if that exactly. makes sense. Yep, yep, yep. All right, what's your number four, Jimmy? My number four is another cycle. Uh, I'm kind of cheating. They're like, top five most wanted reprints. If you count the actual number of cards that I want reprinted on my list, it's like 20 or something. <laughs> it's like 11. Oh, no. It's like 13. 14. It's 17. You totally cheated. I did cheat. Mm, I didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, so um, it's the packed cycle. And oh, yeah. The pack cycle, uh, they're all great cards. They're all zero-cost instants that have uh, kind of an echo cost. You need to pay mana during your next upkeep. Uh, otherwise, you lose the game. And the most famous one is Pack of Negation, which is the zero-cost... Uh, it was originally printed in Future Sight. It's a zero-cost um, instant. It says counter-target spell for zero mana. At the beginning of your next upkeep, pay three blue-blue. If you don't, you lose the game. And there's Summoner's Pack, which is the green version. Uh, as you guys might be able to imagine, it grabs a creature in your deck and puts it out there. There mm-hmm. is Slaughter Pact, which is the black version, which kills a creature. And they all have this sort of, you must pay this mana cost, otherwise you lose the game during your next upkeep. Right. So it sort of blanks your next turn. Maybe not blanks, but it it, it dulls your next turn, but it does something right now for zero. Mm-hmm. Yes. Pact of Negation is an expensive card. Uh, it's in they're, the they're all actually they're all sort of climbing up are they um, yeah because it's think about it, it's a zero cost instant in a game where yeah. you i mean 
I, I don't know how many games I've lost of, of Commander where I'm like, everyone's tapped out. Here comes Insurrection Pact of Negation. Never mind, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because like paying five mana to stop someone from winning the game when they think you have nothing in hand is great. That's why, you know, uh, uh, like that's why Swan Song is also so powerful. It's just very low cost instant that can counter something. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a great call. I want more Pact of Negations at the very least. Slaughter Pact is pretty good negations. too. Summer's Pact kind of sucks, but. Yeah. I mean, Summoner's Pact is still sweet. You get you get to tutor something out. Uh, unfortunately, the it next, tutors into your hand. It tutors into your hand, yeah. and then you have to pay two green green, and you're trying to use that man to probably cast what you tutor. It's up. a super expensive tutor. I wish it said pay you know one in a green, and your next upkeep instead or something because yeah, whatever. Card's still more expensive than Slaughter Pact, surprisingly enough. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. There's probably some sort of combos that I'm not thinking of or I don't know about. So yeah, that's okay. Feel free to yell at me on Twitter. Or in the comment section. You mean type uh, loudly and angrily at you? Yeah, all caps, please, and as many exclamation points as possible. <laughs> um, my number four, this is the one I think is the most probable or possible on my list. I'd agree. So that'll give you some sort of... What, what, it has been reprinted before. Um, before I even say what it is, on the uh, the scale, the storm scale... i give this like a seven, maybe an eight. Wow, you think it's pretty possible? I hope so. Yeah, I think it's time. I, the price on this, I don't think, is fair for what it does, and it, and it, it's it's Wizards has reprinted this before, specifically in Commander products. So they can be like, hey, whoever invests in this, uh, you should know, you should have known better. Should have known better. It we, is, we throw it in a Commander product. It is Oblivion Stone. Wah, wah, wah. So it is a uh, three cost artifact. You can pay four and tap it to put a fake counter on target permanent, or you can pay five and tap and sacrifice the Oblivion Stone, and then you destroy each non-land permanent without a fate counter on it, and then remove all fate counters from all permanents. So you can mm-hmm. sort of slowly protect stuff and then blow up the world, except for the protected stuff. It has... It doesn't over take the, out lands, notably. Right. It has, over the last year, really ballooned in price. I mean, it wasn't even very expensive a year ago, and what's it up to now? It's it, like it jumped in uh, June or something. Yeah, it jumped in June um, from being like a ten dollar card to all of a sudden up to twenty, twenty plus. And this was reprinted in the original Commander set, so that was back all the way in twenty twelve, I think. So it's been a while since this has been reprinted. It was originally in Mirrodin, and they printed less Commander product that back then. We've yeah. seen that a lot of the commanders from that time period have really. Uh, Animar, yeah, Kalia, their all prices those cards. have really gone up. So, a lot of people have gotten into the format clearly since that time period, and the demand has risen. And Oblivion Stone is one of those cards that can be played in every deck. And mm-hmm. actually, certain colors really need this. You know, if you're playing white, maybe not as much, but green really wants, you know, this card. Yeah, Navinuril's Disc, Perilous Vault, that kind of stuff. Uh, red even wants it. That kind of blue probably wants it. So. I just think it's needed. It's necessary. The price is way out of whack. It would be nice if they reprinted it. Yep. I, I think this has a great comparison to Nev's Disc, which was actually printed in last year's Commander product, mm-hmm. um, which is a great board wipe. And I think this is just along those same lines. And there's no reason that it, it shouldn't be reprinted again, uh, especially because a lot of a lot of people... This is another one of those things that makes it hard to get into an older f- a format, but it's also a card that's good for casual play as well because it's a board wipe. Yep, for sure. <laughs> All right. Number three. Numero Trace. Um, Thanos is after this one, guys. Thanos is after this one. <laughs> it is the one and only Gauntlet of Power. Womp, womp, womp. Notably not Gauntlet of Might, guys, even though I am Jimmy the Red, and Gauntlet of Might was my actual pick for this number, but that on the terms of like the storm scale is that's, that's down there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gauntlet of Power is a five-drop artifact. It's a rare from Time Spiral. As Gauntlet of Power comes into play, choose a color. Creatures of the chosen color get plus one, plus one. Whenever a basic land is tapped for mana of the chosen color, its controller adds one mana of that color to his or her mana pool. So this is a world effect. Everyone gets affected by the Gauntlet of Power, but when you play it, you choose the color that it affects, and it doubles the mana of that color every time yep. it's after it. It's great in mono decks, pretty good in in two color decks and after that i wouldn't really use it but yeah yeah makes all your creatures bigger makes all your mana tap for double or some of your mana tap for double uh pretty good card I, what, the card is sweet what's the price tag on this right now uh, it's expensive? about 15 dolores okay. anywhere from yeah sort of so that is unreasonable that's an unreasonably high amount so. well, it's also a five drop artifact right like it, it can't actually cost this much and they're i mean there aren't too many versions of this in fact there's only one version of it from time spiral which is why i think it's a great 
a card that could be reprinted. Um, it's good in two color decks. Like I said, it's best in one in monocolor decks. So, well, maybe... they did just do all the monocolor decks last year. Yeah. And if you're trying to sort of grow a format, it's nice to reward people that oh, bought yeah. the precons last year. So it's a nice addition to be like, hey, we're still supporting monocolor decks. It's pretty bad when you come out with a product and then you just try and ignore it from then out. So yeah, I think, exactly. I think that's a good call. That, I like that card. One out of ten. Where am I at? Um, on the storm scale. I'm going to give you a, I think it's a five. Bing, 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 bing. Yeah. I'll that's, take it. Okay. I gave Oblivion Stone a seven. Maybe I was a little overzealous. These are just totally <laughs> arbitrary numbers, yeah. by the way, people. So, all right. Josh, mine, you're an 11. <laughs> my number three. This one's a zero on the storm scale. Just FYI. Are you sure? Because this one's a 10 in my heart. Yeah. It's a 10 in my heart and it's a zero in reality, unfortunately. It is. Let's give it a 0. 0.1. <laughs> okay. So, there, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, Gaia's Cradle. <laughs> a Gaia's true cr- bing yeah. for this one. Cause <laughs> yep. Gaia's Cradle is a legendary land. You can tap it and add green to your mana pool for each creature you control. What the heck? It's from Urza's Saga. This reminds me of that Rough Fellows guy. Is it like on the reserve list or something? Like, am I stupid? Like, I have no I idea. I mean, I'm stupid for putting it on my list because it's unrealistic. No, you know what? You are allowed to want to have this card be reprinted. It was reprinted as a judge foil, so it's not on the reserve list. Okay, so it's up in the $100 plus range. We, I think we talked about it on one of our High Rollers episodes. Yeah, this is totally a High Roller card. Yeah, this and card... And that's on the lower end of the High Rollers card, too, which is kind of funny. <laughs> it's one of those cards that most decks that have green would want to put this in. Yeah, and it's just really hard to get because it's very expensive. Uh, even if you have the money, you just have to find one still. Yeah, it's pretty intense. I mean, I would love to own a guy's cradle. Yeah, gosh, I can think of like three of my decks that would want it right now. Let's just proxy it, Josh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Don't do it, kids. So for this card, at least. Well, like everybody knows, like, hey, I'm I'm for the people here. I want guys cradle. But if you're sitting there and you've got two or three of them, you're probably like, no, 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 no my do baby, not reprint that, my baby, my cradle, <laughs> my baby, my cradle. Yeah, I, you know, it's too bad. I, it's just one of those super powerful cards that I would love to freaking see. I would just love it, yep. please. Oh Is my it God. played in Legacy or something? I don't think so it's just been printed once in urza saga as a rare and, and once as a very exclusive judge promo and those are both very old sets stupid so. urza saga i was not that was my hi- hiatus from magic was covering that period. hey my hiatus from magic is huge well, and mine all too. the cards i missed i'm just so sad <laughs> but that's why you just got to crack as many packs now so that oh so that in 10 years let me text marshall that, that, that <laughs> straight from the source <laughs> All right, number two. Number Who does two. some number two work for? <laughs> number two, uh, hopefully number two. This will be higher on the scale from one to ten. It is Toxic a Deluge. This is a My good card. favorite board wipe of all time. It was printed once in Commander 2013, and as a result, because it's a Commander-specific card, kind of like Chaos Warp. Uh, mm-hmm. We talked about this earlier in the set. It's getting up there. It's over $10 now, and uh, I don't know. I think it's a great board wipe. I think every deck that plays black should have access to it. And I mean, was this this was both of our number one black card? Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> That's another reason why it's up here. It's awesome, and yeah, the prices definitely continue to rise. Um, it's just very, very good. It it's one of those board wipes that takes care of a lot of different angles. Like it hits indestructible. Yeah, it's also low casting cost. So it's it's lower and you casting can, you cost. You can give than everything damnation. minus thirty nine, minus thirty nine if you want to. If you gosh. want to, yeah. But Timmy and me is like, oh my gosh, nothing will live. Oh crap! I just realized something. What? Neither of us put damnation on our list. <sighs> oh, we're gonna get so in trouble, Jimmy. Uh, no, that's honorable mentions. We have an honorable mention segment that we have not created until this moment, and <laughs> damnation is totally on that list. Wow, we're in trouble. Now you know what? Come on, I, we don't need damnation in black. We have black has some of the best board wipes in the game. I mean, we do need it because there's no reason that it's at the price point that it's at. True, and that's very true. A lot of black decks already have toxic deluge, and they want damnation, but they're just not willing to pay that amount yeah but look just play decree of pain instead all right i'm sorry guys we let you down we whatever let, we totally let you down i don't care decree of pain is way better i'll gladly pay twice the man to draw a billion cards i will totally forgive us for not putting damnation on if my next card is actually reprinted i would you know, the you things... have one or two though i would it just one oh so you're willing to take the hit for the rest of the Heck, world yeah you're I the would... man jimmy wong yeah that's it guys i'm 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 repping y'all i'm repping y'all that collect this card there's some dude with 10 mana crypts right now and he's gonna be like no don't reprint it no spoiler no! alert it's mana crypt it's mana crypt so that's my number two it's a 
about two hundred dollars or something, right? Uh, it's like a hundred. 30 140 oh, depending on how the quality is and if you want the judge promo version that's like close to the 200 i just want any version i'll take uh the ripped uh, almost in half version the damaged and version yeah scotch totally. tape backs together version. that'll still that'll, that'll run you a hundred dollars still sorry <laughs> it's a zero cast artifact at the beginning of your upkeep flip a coin if you lose the flip mana crypt deals three damage to you but you can tap it for two mana it's just another soul ring it's actually slightly better than soul ring yeah um which Soul Ring's probably the single most powerful card. Well, I mean, this does end up doing a lot of damage to you if you get this turn turn zero, you know? No, it does an average turn of 1.5 1. damage to you per turn. Yeah, you know, you could die from that. <laughs> you could die from that. Listen, you this, never know, would, man. this is one of those cards that would go in every single commander deck. Yeah. Um, and the only reason it doesn't is because it's 100 and whatever dollars. Yep. And Please uh, on the Storm it. Scale. Oh, sorry. Toxic Deluge on the Storm Scale. Eh, that's a pretty good chance. I think so. I'd say... It really, really, it's like an eight Give in that they yeah. would, but it, eight, it's not that old, so I'm going to give it a six and a half. Six and a half. Oh, I almost got the <laughs> highest score of the night. Rug pull, rug pull. Yeah, it was a rug pull. <laughs> Dang it. I'm okay with that. Uh, sorry, what do you give Mana Crypt? Um, let's give this one a 9.5 because there is a chance that they won't reprint it. <laughs> right? I feel like we're using different scales. Yeah. Mine's out of 100, so. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes sense. There you go. Yeah. 0. 0.95 on our other scale. Darn. Um, yeah. I, I'm glad that you went with the dream big version of the uh, most wanted reprints because when I made my list, I was like, man, I got to hedge my expectations because I know when I make this list and it doesn't come true, I'm going to be sad. <laughs> Uh, so fortunately, I'm just like the child that thinks that Santa's going to still bring him a pony. Uh, you want a pony? We can get you a pony. Yeah. We cannot get you a man crypt though. Santa's not bringing you a pony because your, your parents talk to him and tell him not to bring the pony, but the kid yeah. still thinks I'm getting a pony. Yeah. Does that kid realize how much upkeep there is to a pony? Do, yeah. And do you don't even understand? have a very big backyard yeah. and where would the pony go? Where's it going to sleep? In yeah. your room? And what happens when the pony turns into a horse? The pony doesn't know how to use the bathroom. Seriously. God, kids. Stop wishing for ponies. But I'm the pony kid. Mana Crypt, let's go. Every kid that wishes for a pony makes the chances of a Mana Crypt being reprinted <laughs> that much less. That's science. Yeah, that is empirical evidence. True I science. spent lots of money to make that study happen, <laughs> and I know it's true for a fact. All right. Uh, my We're on our number ones. Numero uno. You're cheating again. Yeah, I'm cheating again. I like it, though. It is another cycle. Um, I'll give you guys a guess. Good guesses. Great. Nice job. Yeah, it, just yell them at us right now. Oh god, oh, that guy's hey, really loud. I think I think HD Elaine got it. Elaine? It's the Sword of Cycle. This is pretty good. Yeah, these cards are used really a lot and they are expensive and they're all awesome and they're all great for EDH. Yeah, and it'd be cool to do the whole cycle and the enemy paired set. Yeah, like Sword of Light and Shadow. It's a yeah. white black sword. I mean, all the swords, um, they were all printed, I think, in Dark Steel, and some of them were reprinted. The first Modern Masters, they all have a Judge Promo version. They're all just these ridiculously powerful equipments. Um, they all are like, I think they're all three mana. The Sword of Light and Shadow just read uh, Equipped Creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from white and black, thus light and shadow. Whenever Equipped Creature deals combat to a player, you may gain you gain three life and you may return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand, and it costs two to equip. So five mana total for this just insane card that gives protection, it gives I mean, a, a stat bonus, and it also like does two things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, sort of feast and famine. That's I think, I think is, the best one for EDH. Yeah, because it untaps all your lands. And if you guys think about feast and famine, what two colors could that be? Black and green. Yep. So you get pro black and green plus two plus two. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card, and you untap all lands you control. Yeah. So it doubles your mana. Pretty sweet. Makes them discard a card, protects the creature from two colors, and makes it bigger. Um, these cards are all really awesome and they're mostly very expensive yeah they're i mean some of them are worse like the sword of fire and ice is not the best sword by far mm -hmm. um for some reason it's one of the more expensive ones it's good in other formats though i think it's not the best for commander but it's true actually no sword of fire and ice is pretty good you get a draw card oh yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. i'm sorry I was, I, thinking I was thinking of um sword of body and mind body and mind i believe yeah body and mind where you get to i think mill some stuff no you put a you get, yeah you <laughs> You mill someone for 10, and then you get some some wolves. Body of mind still is good. still good, right? I mean, it's protection from green and blue. When it says protection from, the, that's what really makes all of these swords super awesome. And they're all three drops. They all quit for two. They're very reasonably costed. 
This would be sweet if they reprinted this. I'm giving this on the storm scale like a three. Yeah, I'll take three. Yeah, I don't think it's very likely, but it's not completely crazy. It's not gay, gay as cradle. Or it's mana, not a pony. No, it's not mana crypt. It's not a pony. <laughs> it's not a pony, guys. Come on. It's not a freaking unicorn over here. <laughs> Ain't no mythical animal. Uh, oh, that yeah. would be sweet. Though. I would love to see these reprinted. Um, you know, they reprinted one of the swords in the event deck. So Feast and Famine was in there. Oh, yeah. The, true, uh, true, the true. modern oh, They reprinted deck. them in uh, the first Modern Masters. There is yeah. a precedent for them to reprint it. So it, it's possible. But all of them? Like, if it was just one, maybe, but all of them, that seems more unlikely to me. Yeah, most certainly. Uh, okay, my number one. I give this 10 out of 10. I want this reprinted so badly. It needs to be reprinted. There's There are some arguments against it. Um, it very much needs to. It was an uncommon when it was originally printed. Mm-hmm. It's, like, around 30 bucks or something now. Like, it's kind of crazy. It's Sensei's Divining Top. Yeah, this card is the best. This card um, is... And it was also very controversial. It is controversial, so let let's let me read the card really quick. Okay, so it's an artifact. It's a one drop. It has two activated abilities. You can pay one mana. Look at the top three cards of your library, then put them back in any order. So you don't draw one. You just look at the three and then r- order them. And you usually yeah. do that before your turn, so you can choose what you're going to draw. And then you can tap the top and draw a card, and then put Sensei's Divining Top on top of its owner's library. So you can sort of swap it with the top card of your library. So you can basically look at the top three cards, then draw one of them right now. You can also protect the top if somebody, like, destroys all non-land permanents. Yeah. Or points a removal spell at it. Or it's just very hard to get rid of. I mean, yeah, oftentimes you're going to be using that to save it from someone destroying all artifacts or whatever. And that's the most ridiculous part about this. It's a one drop. You can play it. It doesn't matter if you draw in your next turn because it, you're going to be able to play it. No big yep. deal. Yep. You know, this and card it just is smooths out all your draws. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's basically, I'd say, close to Soul Ring power level. It's one of the cards that would go in every deck like mana yep. crypt yep i think literally 99.9 percent of decks if they don't have a divining top in them would be better if they did yeah and of course there are arguments about this card in general some people think it should be banned from legacy because it sees a lot of play there um, it makes miracles it makes uh, like big time possible yeah it also slows down the game that's the big thing yeah uh divining top if you've got two or three of them out you'll notice that your game slows down a lot because people are like i top and then they look at the top three cards and reorder them and then something happens and they go okay i top yeah so that can change because i'd rather have this card on top than this one now well everyone's turns that has a top they essentially the end step before them is when they really start their turn yeah and that can sometimes lead to very long games because everyone's like hold but on sometimes they want to gr- draw that card because they need it right now so yeah. they'll put like an, a counter spell there and they won't they won't want it, but if they'll have access to it if they have to. Yeah. And then you're like, nothing happened that they wanted to counter spell, so they want to rearrange the card. So and that that's just a lot of accounting every turn. Yep, but this card's super sweet. Um it it reminds me of Sylvan Library of Miri's Guile, except it's something that you can do yourself and I there have been so many times when I don't have a land in my hand and I have a top out and I see there's a land on top, so I just crack the top because i don't care if i draw it next turn i need to play that land this turn to do something else you know yep and then you just play the top for one and then find the next land yeah playing the top is essentially having a an eight card maximum hand at all times um it's pretty sweet you could play the top card of your library whenever you want essentially for a very low cost it's just one mana the next time you draw the top to play it out again so what am i on the real storm scale gosh um they reprinted this in from the vault exiled 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 (laughs) Exiled. Exiled, and it was originally in Champions of Kamigawa. I think you're at a... Uh... <sighs> they do like reprinting stuff for Legacy. Uh, you it know what? It was an uncommon... I'm going to put you at a three and a half. Like... Oh, that's not bad, actually. I think there's a chance. Yeah, it's not big, but that's better than I thought. I don't think they like reprinting stuff for Legacy. I think they won't ever right. say this, but I think they're trying to kill Legacy mm. in the long term. I think they want Modern to be their Legacy. It's a format that... They have control of every card. Legacy is a format where there's a whole bunch of cards that are staples that they aren't allowed to right. reprint. So that may be controversial. But You know where I think where else a lot of these cards could show up? Um, well, not Man and Crypt or Guy's Cradle. 
Conspiracy. Conspiracy, yeah. Oh, yeah. Except you put Di- Di- Divining Top as a mythic. <laughs> of course, but it'd be great. Yeah, it'd be totally great. Can um, you believe it wasn't uncommon? That's insanity. That is insanity. If I was playing the game at the time, oh, gosh. I, I know I, I would have played the Kamigawa set a lot, too, because it's like got sweet Asian themes, even though it wasn't fun to draft or whatever. But but that's still, what people say. I would have drafted the crap out of it. I think our buddy Wes said he has like 10 Divining Tops, Divining Wes. Tops. Yes. Wes, how dare you? Lucky Wes. Um, honorable mentions real fast. Uh, Gamble is a card that I would love to see as well. Imperial it's Recruiter. We, we Imperial didn't actually Recruiter, mention yeah. a bunch of uh, Portal 3 Kingdoms, but this is a place they could do that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, also, Umazawa's GT. I totally oh, forgot about that the card. Jitty? The Jitty? The yeah. Jitty. Uh, another card that was, I think it was non uncommon. No, this was a rare, right? Mm-hmm. This was a rare, but it was also from the Kamigawa set. And this is just like the coolest equipment ever. It's so sweet. It's, I like the swords better. Yeah, you know, I, I like the Swords Bear too. I think I just have a Rafik deck that would always want the, the Umazawa's shitty. Yeah, for sure. Um, or how G- dare you? I'm looking at the honorable mention list. Oh, yeah, I put Blood Moon on there too. Boo! <laughs> that was as a joke. When Josh <laughs> sent me the outline, he gave me five uh, of his just fake off the top of his head recommendations for my reprint list. And Blood Moon was on it. So was Curd I- Ape. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Kurt Ape needs a reprint bad. What are you talking about? You know, eventually, totally, Kurt Ape should get a reprint. (laughs) In the enemy paired set, it would be bad. That Uh, is so funny. Yeah. And Iona again, of course. They love reprinting it. Why not? Why not? Yeah. yeah, Just one more time, you know? Just, hey. One more time. Time. Iona. Okay. Uh, we did get some uh, people on Twitter because we did do the call out on Twitter asking for what other people thought yeah. should be reprinted. So we had some cool answers there. Uh, Mike M at SpedX111 says Master Biomancer, Progenitor Mimic, and some other spicy Simic things. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Simic. Uh, yep. By the way, that's X11, Josh. That's He's Sped 12. Oh, he's not, not Sped, sped 13. 13. Come My on. Bad. Unlucky number, bro. David Lowe at DLow272 said, Stranglehold, Blood Moon, <laughs> Armageddon, you know, just the fair stuff. Uh, so David Lowe is a mean person. <laughs> David Lowe, why are you so evil? David, I like Armageddon. Those other, Stranglehold and Blood Moon, not my favorite. Uh, Stranglehold's not so bad. <laughs> Stranglehold's not so bad, Actually, yeah. just Blood Moon is uh, objectionable. Uh, David B at a humble grumble said, I'd love to see Sensei's Divining Top come back. Uh, it's an uncommon that goes for 40 bucks. They reprinted Soul Ring, so... Dot, dot, dot. So that's a good argument. That's a good argument. It's another one-drop artifact. Soul Ring's been reprinted a bunch of times, and still like 4 to $5, which yeah. is insane to me. Uh, Drew Bentley at Quad9 says, Shardless Agent and Gisela. Now, Gisela, I think, is actually very high on the possible reprint list. Yeah? Uh, yeah, because it's it's totally like a sweet Boros Commander, um, and it's it was, an, it was a mythic from Avacyn. True, it's a little bit spendy. Yeah, it's just sweet, too. It doesn't do anything interesting. It just doubles damage and ma- halves damage. Yeah. You know, the thing is, it's it's a, if a source would deal damage, then you can just go nuts with, like, pingers and stuff. And I guess. There, there are more interesting ways to build Gisela than than the new, um, what's her name, Kalemni, at least Disciple of Eroas, I think. Uh, Matt Lewis, who is at LewisMD13. Oh, Lewis is evidently a doctor. Oh. Enemy fetch lands. Ding. Ding. But really, so he doesn't believe it's possible yeah. either. Uh, but really, Command Tower, Demonic Tutor, Toxic Deluge, Damnation, Unintentionally Blacklist. Yes, yeah. all his cards are black. Um, Except for Command Tower. Command Tower has a good chance. They, they, reprint they always reprint Command Tower, yeah. 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 They, there's never, I don't think, a Command Well, in the monos, they didn't because you don't need it in monocolored. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, Demonic Tutor, that's another good one, actually. Yeah, I could see the d toots getting reprinted. I don't know. I think they want to be careful about printing tutors. Um, do they? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, I mean, like, let's see here. They they're not going to reprint uh, doubling season anytime soon, right? They did primal vigor, which is their version of a reprint. I think doubling season is a little bit different, although they did reprint it in uh, modern masters. But it it, it messes up planeswalkers to yeah. a weird degree. So well, primal vigor is also an enchantment that affects the whole board, and I think that's more fun. Yeah, I think a, that's totally a, fair. Yeah, so I think I think if they did do something like demonic tutor, they might do something that is more more of a. Uh, they still print tutor version? cards. Bring to Light is an interesting tutor. They yeah, just reprinted that's true. Dark Petition. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think they're as reticent about tutors as Sheldon Mennery is. So, that's true. Yeah. 
Yeah, Black definitely has a lot of spicy reprints. That, I mean, Black in general just has so many good, like Damnation and Toxic Deluge, for example, are just two very good cards that would be w- amazing if they're reprinted. I would say that Damnation was probably, I mean, we just read a few of the people, but we got a, probably like 100 responses. And uh, I would say that Damnation was probably the most mentioned. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's the card a lot of people are crying out for. You know what I say? Just play white. <laughs> <laughs> Wrath of God is way cheaper. Wrath of God so is, yeah, judgment. exactly. And it's sweet. Wrath of God. You don't even need to swear when you say the name. Gosh. <laughs> Come on, guys. Gosh. Jeez. Gosh. Jeez. Um, okay. So next episode. Next episode. We want to talk about this because we're going to try something new for our Thursday episode this weekend. Yes, there is a Thursday episode. Yeah. So we're going to be doing a, a little bit of talk on Battle for Zendikar Draft. That's not Commander. That is not Commander. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Our Thursday episodes, if you'll remember, uh, it's, uh, we, we said it before, yeah. but we're going to do them intermittently, and they're not always going to be about Commander now. We're going to try and branch out and talk about some other interesting things about magic that you know we find fun and we want to talk about. Yeah, and it's going to keep gonna, us interested. You know, And we're going to call those episodes the sideboard episodes. Yeah. So our first sideboard episode will be this Thursday, and we're going to talk about Battle for Zendikar Draft. Something that I've been doing a lot of, and you have as well. Yeah, so pretty excited to talk about Draft. Uh, it'll be fun. Yeah, if you guys didn't know, that's definitely the other main format that Josh and I play is Drafting. Yeah, we play um, that a ton, and it's, it's, it's the format I sort of play when I'm not actually playing with friends, although we'll draft with friends too, but... Yeah. At home, Jimmy and I both play quite a bit of MTGO, and that's what we do. We, we draft on MTGO. Yep. So that's definitely the easiest place to do it as well, because you don't have to, need to go to a game store and wait. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, hey, I'm here. When you guys said you're going to start at two, but there's two other people here. All right, I'll wait till five. All right, cool. We did it. Here, fire the we pod. We did it. Yeah. You it's know, Moto so fires much all the time. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of Moto. Uh-huh. Our next week episode. We have a special guest. We do. It's going to be one of our first. Uh, It'll episodes. be our second time. Se- a second Wizards employee we've right. ever had on. Correct. Um, so Adam Prozac, who works in R&D at Wizards as a game designer, he's going to come on the show to talk about the new Legendary Cube on MTGO. And Ooh. and that Legendary Cube, by the way, is very closely tied in with Commander 2015 because they're... Go- so they're not selling the Commander 2015 pre-cons on Magic Online. The way that you're going to be able to get the new cards is they're going to be in the Legendary Cube, which is a cube themed around legendary cards yeah and and we've talked to them a little bit obviously leading up to this episode and the legendary cubes actually designed to play somewhat like commander Ooh, so they exciting. definitely wanted to get that type of flavor and that type of feel into it and also the other part of this episode which is exciting is that we're going to be releasing our exclusive commander 2015 spoiler card at the same time at the same time oh so, yeah so Make sure to tune in next week. Uh, I should say, because of the timing and, and scheduling it with Adam and, and Wizards and everything, that episode will be released on Thursday, uh, which is... November it, 5th. Yes, Thursday the 5th uh, instead of the Tuesday. So we're going to have an episode this Thursday, and then we'll have an episode the following Thursday. There will be no episode on Tuesday the 3rd. Yep. Very exciting. Oh, man, this is so cool. Um, I, I feel very honored that Wizards approached us to interview someone on the team about this cube because I'm looking forward to it. And in, anytime a new cube is announced, that's, like, sweet because I've been playing so much of Craig's cube, the multiplayer cube, that we will talk about eventually on the show. Which is basically like a legendary cube. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's going to be really exciting to see. I I'm a, I believe it's going to be a 1v1 cube. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's going to be really fun to see what kind of decks you can make out of that. I have a ton of fun drafting the legacy cube whenever I get a chance. That thing is insane. Well, I think it's really it's interesting because we're going to do our Battle for Zendikar draft, our first episode ever about draft. And yeah. then we're going to do an episode that's basically about a commander draft format. So Ooh. how perfect is that? Yeah, exactly. It's a primer to help you get, you know, in the in the rhythm, the biorhythm. In the biorhythm. Bi- yeah. The band biorhythm? Band biorhythm. In the shaman of the pack. Forgotten ways. Forgotten ways, that's right. Not shaman of the pack. Jeez. It's, Come yeah. on, Jimmy. Get let's get in that shaman of the forgotten way. That sounds let's wrong. Get- <laughs> All right. Let's just move right on to the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. What is this segment? Do we need to prepare for this segment? Because I did not prepare for this segment. Jimmy, you just came back from someplace awesome. Oh, that's right. I would. I have spent two weeks preparing for this segment. <laughs> it, I came back from a two-week trip in Europe to cover uh, the quarterfinal and the, uh, the end of the group stages for League of Legends, the World Championships, the World Cup. Uh, I watched the only two North American teams just get destroyed in the final round of, of uh, the uh, 
group stages. Now, when I was into <sighs> League of Legends, which was a few years ago, yeah. when I was watching it a lot, the North American teams were not as good as especially the asian teams yeah are they still lower tier or is this just something that happened we there was a flash right of, of brilliance uh that there was a team called cloud nine oh, they're yeah. the, the chosen ones uh uh they actually there was a lot of drama they lost one of their key team members who came back because he was the shot caller of the team and this team has always the done jungler? well uh yeah he's jungling now his name is high um and he's always done really well uh for the team because he's the shot caller and you need someone there to direct everyone so around. the most important player on the team. Yeah, because you don't have a coach there when you're playing. You're not allowed to have one. It's just you and the other four players in your team. So he left the team and then came back because the team started tanking and they brought him back in a new role, but he was still doing shot calling and they went through this thing called the gauntlet where they had to win a ton of games to even qualify for Worlds and they did it. It was incredible and they got to Worlds and they went 3-0 and then they went and lost every single game after that uh, and did not qualify to the next stage, uh, which was really sad because it was the only North American team left that actually had a chance, we thought. And looking at it now, we realized that there was no chance whatsoever. It was all fluke and America sucks. Uh, yeah, we're not good, as good at video games as the We're not as good, general, yeah. yeah. We may have more heart and the game may be bigger in this country in certain ways, uh, but <laughs> I don't think that really matters at the end of the day. Um, and here's the thing, like we've even recruited team players from Europe, from right. Korea and stuff. And there's a lot of that sort of incestuous taking and giving of players now that happens in the in in league. Uh, but we're still not at the same level tier as uh, SKT or Faker, you know, like the greatest player this game has ever seen and StarCraft as well at that for what matters. There's something <laughs> about Korea. There's something in the water there. Um, well, it's just the culture too. and yeah, They uh, play a lot of video games. And you, if you yeah. go to a PC bong in Seoul... It's not what you think it will look like. There'll be a lot of like businessmen in suits playing. Like it's culturally like such a big deal. It's totally different than how it is in the states. Yeah. Uh, so that was a lot of fun though. I got to go to a couple of different viewing parties, meet a lot of fans. Met. Uh, I played Magic a few times. I drafted Battle for Zendikar over there, and I met a guy that listened to the podcast. Nice. Where was so, that? So uh, that was in this really cool little like it was this bar connected to an Indian restaurant that Tim Willoughby told me about. Is uh, it in London? It was in London, yeah. And they drafted every Wednesdays and Fridays. Cool. And you could get a beer and get curry and eat and draft at the same time. Like, it awesome. was just this, like, uh, I loved it. I love the idea of uh, being able to buy a legal beer and drink it and play cards at the same time <laughs> in this outdoor setting. Or indoor, but, you know, not outside of your regular house. Like, you're not bringing a beer into your LGS anytime soon. How did you do in that draft? That's the important uh, thing. I went 2-1. I had a nutty green-black deck. It was sweet. Nice. Okay. Time for the cleanup step. Make sure to listen to our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern, Alex Kessler Woo. and Ben Bateman talk about modern magic, sorry, modern as a format, and all things competitive magic. You can find them on rocketjump.com uh, slash the MMcast. Or on Twitter at the MMcast. And our editor for the show is Terry. What's Terry's last name again? Robertson. Terry Robertson. We still have Eli Cuevas on this, on this copy. I'm sorry, Terry. I didn't mean to offend you. You're our editor. Eli's gone. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the Living Cards animation. You can find him at Living Cards MTG, and all of his animations are on our videos that Terry edits at YouTube.com slash The Command Zone Podcast. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you on Thursday. Peace. Later. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>